Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our sermon today comes from Peter's first letter, in fact, from the third chapter in the 15th verse. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. As I was talking with to the children, hope is, well, it's a very interesting word in the Bible. When we talk about hope today, we might say something like, well, I hope it rains, which means I'm pretty sure it's not going to rain, but I really wish that it would. Now, with this kind of hope, there's always the possibility that we might not get what we want, what we are hoping for. But that's not how the word hope is used in Holy Scripture. In the Bible, hope is a word describing total and absolute confidence. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The hymn expresses a confidence, a trust, a certainty in the blood and righteousness of Jesus for our salvation. In Peter's letter he writes, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and and respect. So what is this hope in us? God the Father, out of His grace and His love for us, indeed for you, gave His only Son to bridge that gap that has separated us from Himself. And Christ Jesus suffered and died in the place of sinners, in your place and thus satisfying the Father's just and deserved wrath against human sin, and thereby effecting true reconciliation between God and mankind for those who believe. And then he rose from the dead. He conquered sin, death, and all the powers of Satan, and by the grace of by His grace, He extended to humanity through His death and resurrection that we can share in His victory over the grave. And that is our hope. That's our confidence. Through Jesus Christ, we can come before our Heavenly Father clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Now, St. Peter's first epistle was written the audience he was talking to were those believers who were facing persecution. And so Peter calls them to always be ready to make a defense. What he means is that believers are to be ready to give answers to objections to Christianity. Now when the Christians in Peter's time were charged by the Roman state with atheism, that is, they did not worship the Roman gods, they were ordered then to recant their faith. These Christians then had to be ready to defend this hope in Christ despite the threats of prison and the threats of torture. Peter's instruction here in 1 Peter 3 verse 15 then means that believers were have to be ready already reflecting upon this answer. St. Paul joins in a similar way, saying in Philippians that we live in a crooked and twisted generation. We live in a, a culture of death, but Paul goes on to say that we, we shine as lights in the world. We have a hope that is in us 
And in a culture where death is so often preferred over life, in a culture where death is considered actually a friend, someone to be sought after, well, we have a hope that is in us which is indeed full of life. We have life in Jesus Christ. And He is the Lord of life. And that is our identity. We identify with the living one. The one who once was dead but now is alive forevermore. Death has no hold over him. You see, in the culture of death, there is no hope. There's no hope for those who have no identity in God. Without knowing the Lord of hope, there is no identity as parents, as spouses. Without God, a fetus has no identity. And therefore the world says, it's not a baby. It's a lump of cells. Go ahead, this, this abortion is fine. It's your body. Now without God, the elderly the infirm, the terminally ill, have no identity. Therefore, when they feel like they are not productive anymore, when they are a burden to others, and the pain is too much, they identify with that failing, with that disease, with that infirmity. And so it's easy then to opt for assisted suicide. But our identity as children of God gives us hope and fills us with life. And where does our hope and our life come from? It comes from the study of God's Word. Now you have been prepared in your lives through, through the catechism, through the memorization that those mean old pastors made you do, those mean old mom and dad, they had you memorize Scripture. Scripture that you needed to be ready you need to stay ready and that means you shouldn't let your catechism or your Bible gather dust on that shelf it's not just for show when the pastor comes by to your house but it also means that you should take advantage of what God regularly and continually provides to prepare yourself for the opportunity to give an account for the hope that is in you. And so, brothers and sisters, you come to the divine service where God serves you on Sunday, where you hear of God's great love, His infinite love for you in Jesus Christ. And then you attend the Bible study to learn even more about God, about His love for you, about His continuing work in your life. And in all these ways, God is working in you to prepare you to make that defense of the hope, of the confidence that you have in our Savior. Now, it's not that Jesus needs defending, per se. He certainly does not. He didn't even defend himself before the chief priest, or before Pilate, or before Herod. He willingly took his sentence of death on the cross. And yet God has given you a blessed opportunity to defend your hope. You have the privilege, indeed the honor, to make the case for salvation through Christ's death and resurrection to anyone. To anyone who comes to you and asks you, why? Why do you believe this? It's not always that they come and ask, but from time to time, they do. And we are blessed with that opportunity. Indeed, God really provides plenty of these opportunities in your life. If you really look around you, if you think of the people you know, the people you see, the places where you are, think of that neighbor and that friend who's, who seems depressed. He needs your witness of the gospel. He needs to know that Jesus is the answer to these deep 
deep troubles. Or the young lady down the road who's looking for love in, as they say, all the wrong places. She needs your witness of the Gospel. She needs to know that in Jesus she will find all of the love, all the fulfillment that she needs, that whole within her. That's where God seeks to dwell. And your witness will be credible. Why, you ask? Because you live your life as a Christian in such a manner that others do. They see God within you. They see His love shining through. And this indeed will bring them to ask you about your hope. Remember, the only way that you can be ready to give an account for the hope that is within you is through the study of God's Word. The place where He has appointed Himself to be found, where the Spirit says, Here I will work in you, to build you up, to strengthen you, to guide you. The Word of God empowers you to live as God's child and to be a powerful witness of the Christian faith that encourages, that inspires those around you to want what you have. And so invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite anyone to church so that they can hear this sweetness, these sweet words of Jesus, the sweetest words they'll hear this side of heaven. Words that we sometimes might take for granted. They will hear, and indeed, brothers and sisters, you will hear. The Heavenly Father, when He says to them, through His Gospel, through those appointed to proclaim His Word, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our hope and our life. Amen.